Hello everyone, happy Sunday. Welcome to the YouTube channel, The Narrow Path, live and in color. And we do attempt to be colorful, hopefully, for a good reason. And uh, so we're here today, and uh, you're here. Maybe you're coming back watching this later after um, you attended church somewhere, or maybe you're like me every now and again, and you go to church, but every now and then, you know, you find yourself playing hooky, because finding church in um, America these days is not always easy. If you haven't come to realize that, and your only excuse is always, yeah, but you need to be there anyway. I get it. You're right. I give you that, that you need to be with other believers. But sometimes finding the place where you can really fit and you can really um, give of your time and talents and um, tithes because you know it's going to a right place and to the right cause, those are things to, to really consider. So I get it. I've gone through that battle for years, but I've always pursued finding a place that I can call home base and I'm in the process of doing that now and uh, so pray for me about that and I'll pray for you um, but we're going to get into today we're, we're getting into Romans 7 which is a powerful powerful chapter Romans 8 is uh, amazing as well those of you who are in the faith know those of you who are not not so much that's okay but we'll get to it hopefully I'll make it <clears throat> no less amazing by communicating it to you. But anyway, we're going to read Romans 7 verses. I think we just go through verse 12 today, and uh, then we'll just get right on into it. The Word of God says in Romans chapter 7, verse 1, Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives, for a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. Duh. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. We get it. Verse 4. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. God is really into fruit. We've said that a lot. It's an important theme in the scripture, so really pay attention to that. For while we were living in our flesh, our sinful passions, and we have them, aroused by the law, we're at work in our members to bear fruit, oh yeah, but for death instead, right? But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Well, verse 7, what then shall we say that the law is sin? By no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity, that's key, through the commandment produced in me all kinds of covetousness, for apart from the law, sin lies dead. Verse 9, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive, and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me for sin, seizing an opportunity. That's the second time Paul has said that. Through the commandment deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means it was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. That's a mouthful there from the Apostle Paul. And so we'll just get into it here. Um, as we know, Paul has, has uh, invoked questions that he knows his audience has been asking as he has very painstakingly been laying out the gospel and his masterpiece, the book of Romans, I feel and many agree that it is a masterpiece, even people who who don't um, necessarily believe in Christianity. And he, he does so so that we'll understand it fully. In fact, if you remember in the beginning, Paul started out addressing the diehard pagans who are that way and, and proud of it. And we've got a lot more of those these days uh, all around us, and we need to be aware of that and how we respond to them. That's another story. He also addressed the habitual hypocritical moralist. 
and then lastly um, to the uh, the Jewish poker face or basically the Jews his own people and throughout this time he has continued to remind each of these groups and anybody else who wants to get some a thing or two so as to really drill it into them but then now as we enter chapter 7 Paul comes back to his own people who are no doubt going to have a little tougher time with this grace thing and in some sense, as they perceive, rightly, the de-escalation of the law's importance, understand correctly, specifically as it relates to its inability to, to exact the true spirituality and righteousness that God wants from us. And we, of course, explained the gospel already, and I, I would hope that, um, and, and we did so in detail so that we know both what it is and what it isn't. But in our first up at bat in Romans 7 today, Paul is back to, and thus our title this morning, a message to those who should be in the know, his own people, yet again. And the reason, of course, is because like most of us, they also are particularly slow learners in letting go of their identity. They had a hard time with that. We talked about that as Jews and then re-looking at what they thought was the Holy Grail to in fact see what God's intent was all along with the gospel story and the great rescue that like Moses when he rescued his people from Egypt he has done again and you know he's going to do it one more time too by the way and in many ways though almost undoing all that they thought that they knew of how to get to God and into his good graces and I think with our own mirror um, we should be able to have empathy here in regards to their continued struggle that, that continues to this day and so Paul is going to come back to the law especially the legislative aspect of it and he will relate it this time to the binding nature of marriage and he does so by saying that the law in a marriage is at first legislative and therefore binding it is a binding law we all know this it's not just two people got married there's a law that says this is in fact intact it is a marriage and in god's idea it should be broken so in other words he understands why they're hung up on any perceived hint at their disobedience to it and what they see is now disregarding it as he's laying out the gospel so he feels that he has a little more explaining to do to them and then so in verse 3, um, Paul says, All righty then, <laughs> that's my Jim Carrey addition to the scripture. Sorry, Lord. To those of you who know the law, then you know that the law is in fact legislative and therefore binding on someone as long as they are above the ground and not under it yet. Mark Prince translation. In other words, under that contractual relationship before God and in the written code, which they're really... Uh, still very much hung up uh, on and about as Paul speaks about in our text the two are bound to it in a marriage but Paul says so he can make this correlation to what's happened now that if a woman's husband dies or, or vice versa uh, he or she is released and that though she would be called an adulteress if she was in the marriage still under normal circumstances uh, if he dies all bets are off and she, she's free and so then in verse 4, Paul then makes a quick contrast to that relationship in, in, in the sense that, um, that we've already been told about, whereby we died to the law through the body of Christ as we died in baptism. Baptism is really important. When we were baptized and now belong to him, and also we rise like him to the newness of life, for he calls the newness of the spirit. And for Paul's further illustration here, this new marriage okay and he says this very uh, acutely to remind them uh, as we find in verse 10 that this very law or commandment although it came with a bang promising um, with its content the law is amazing and its intent as it pertains to life that in actuality it actually proved itself to be death to us which which we're going to get to so then, though the law is binding, Paul says, and likewise for illustrative purposes, 
uh, a marriage is binding, we have, like this marriage illustration is talking about, died to the law. Just like the man died and the woman is free, we died to the law and are now free. And we had to die to it in order to be married to Christ and not the law in a new relationship that could actually gain from us the real love that would lead to a marriage that would actually last. And so what Paul will then say is that instead of being in this bad marriage arrangement, because the law died and we died to it, that secondly, the way of the Spirit now supersedes the binding marital relationship because the death has taken place due to the marriage becoming unfruitful. And at the tail end of verse 3 tells us that since her original husband has died, she's now free from that law. And for our sakes, from the dependence upon keeping it, the law, somewhere, anywhere, um, to somehow get us to God, as a reminder, that we, we that it's, it's, that's a canceled check, can't run it back through the bank, it does, it hasn't worked. Now, as we know, this idea of something superseding the law was, was already promised in Jeremiah and Ezekiel and other of the, of the prophets, one such um, scripture that comes to mind is Ezekiel eleven nineteen, the key verse also that says uh, verse nine, and I will give them one heart and a new spirit. Sounds like the language of Paul here, doesn't it? I will put within them, I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh, and give them a heart of flesh. So I'll take the stone out and give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statues and keep my rules and obey them. The law didn't actually get that done. And so for those uh, in the know who still have the deer in the headlights look, when Paul talks about this, it is obviously something they should have already known and that Paul now then wants to again make very clear to them. So uh, Paul says, we are free spiritually and thus dead to the law now for very three, uh, three very clear reasons that he's going to lay out for us here. And the first one is because the law, the bad marriage, actually had the adverse effect of inciting obedience to it always. The law, this bad marriage that Paul's making the correlation to, had the adverse effect of inciting disobedience to it always. In fact, verse 5 tells us clearly where Paul writes, For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death not life, not for God. Okay, it had the adverse effect. So then we had a marriage that was, uh, uh, we suppose was under the God-given purpose to be fruitful and multiply godly offspring and or fruit, but that instead produced only bad fruit. And then Paul says that by, I think in his mind, taking us back to a very familiar place in the Garden of Eden, and what it did to the very first of us human beings that put our foot on the ground, who though given a word from God, hear me, as to all the things they could do in this beautiful, breathtaking garden, which we, we just have no idea. They were also given one simple thing, and, and it's symbolic, okay, that they could not do or have, and what was the result? Well, I thought you'd never ask. The Word of God tells us in verse 11 of our text that we are in this morning, for sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and it killed me, Paul says. And well, if you're, if you're paying attention, that is, of course, what happened to Adam and Eve. I mean, for after Eve was deceived, we're told in chapter 3, verse 6, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took its fruit. We don't know what that fruit was, what it symbolized, anything like that, really. We have a lot of speculation, but that's all it is. And ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened... They recognized their sin, right? And they knew that they 
were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Interesting. So then the very law of God that they knew was binding was a very prohibition that instead of generating their obedience to it, it had the adverse effect and caused them to rebel as a result of believing the lie that Satan had told them, the twisting of the truth. That, that lie that was to distort God's clear word to them and say that God didn't mean it in the way that they thought or that he actually said, and that instead that law made them want to do it all the more, and as a result they immediately knew that they were with, that, that they were at odds with God because of it. They knew they were naked. They knew they were laid bare. And so like our first exemplars of how not to do it, Paul reminds us that all too familiar story to where sin seized an opportunity. Paul used that twice in our passage of, uh, of 1 through 13. Through the commandment, verse 11 of Romans 7, and thus we were deceived and we died spiritually immediately as a result. And that word opportunity is actually a military term for a position seized in a war inside of enemy territory that then became a base of operations to inflict casualties on the enemy from the inside. Huh. That's kind of interesting. Keep that thought. It says a lot. There are things that most of us forget, or we think it rather silly to think of this world we live in as a war zone, and yet the Bible is, is quite frankly, chock full with examples over and over again to the contrary, to which we, I think, ignore to our peril. People just trotting on along like everything's, hey, it just, it just is what it is. You come and you go, you, get, you check in, you check out, that's it, grab all you can, and that's it. it made, we don't see it as a battle zone. We, we, we don't, and, uh, you know, I think that's, that's definitely to our peril. But sin separates us from God, the Bible teaches, and it results in death. And like Paul alludes to, as this is now bonding like a marriage, unless we die to something, there is not a chance for a new and living way to get in and strengthen uh, and straighten things out. And we know that both physical death and spiritual death came as a result of this original sin. The spiritual death was immediate and the physical death would come later and it has been coming later for everybody ever since thus the shape we're in and we also know that without an alternate plan this is it's the shape we're going to always be in you know and I'm of course really revealing my age here but uh, Flip Wilson would famously say many many years ago that the devil made me do it and that's true enough and that will preach, but in actuality, it was the commandment, that which was spiritual and good, Paul said itself, telling us not to do something that gave the devil and sin an opportunity inside enemy territory, God being the enemy, to, to Satan from inside to gnaw at us to do what we could not help but do as a result. But, as my old pastor friend once correctly said, you may have heard me say on here before because it bears repeating, if you don't believe in original sin, just come watch the nursery this Sunday and you'll know all about it. And we don't have to teach it. The commandment and our desire to break the law innately will always get the job done. And you can test this however you want and the results will always be come back positive. So Paul says that the law had the adverse effect of its intent due to what it, it, it actually did deep within us coupled with the devil's opportunity. But also, secondly, because the law killed the hope of producing the spiritual it intended and instead produced the exact opposite. We see that in verse 10 and 11. And Paul also says that though the law is spiritual and good and it's intent to be sure, Paul says, hey, I'm not, not knocking the law, guys, but it in itself could not deliver on its intent in the long term. You see, and you guys should know, you live through it, you, sh you should know about your forefathers, you should know about yourself. 
I mean, you could obey it for a time or two, but sooner or later that commandment would tick you off. And your sinful nature brought in through that opportunity pulled a one-two punch and you had your middle finger up just like everybody else at the audacity of someone telling you you couldn't do whatever the hell you wanted to do. It's my life and I'll do what I want. In fact, I like what Michael Gorman says in his commentary on Romans where he, he writes that in actuality, the law generates new opportunities for us to exercise our creative abilities to manufacture new kinds of evil that we can get away with. And I think he's spot on. And so instead of real and lasting good fruit that God desires from us, he has all the way from the beginning, it created in us the very opposite of such fruits of the Spirit and instead were of the flesh that Paul talks about in Romans 7. But Galatians 5, 19 to 21 tells us what those are. The works of the flesh are evidence, sexual immorality of any kind, okay? Fill in the blank. Impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you beforehand, that those who do such things, or rather practice such things continually, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Yeah, so the Bible's not always your BFF, but I'll tell you what, it talks about the real facts on the ground if you care to know them. So the law killed this hope of producing the spiritual intended, but then lastly, as surely as we know, it did something that only the law could do in order to bring us to Christ, you see. It positively, number three, did reveal sin of its true colors and thus showed us clearly, hear me this morning, what is wrong with the world. And the law did this to a T, in fact. In fact, we're told in our text that it came alive this reality that we're talking about. A reality that had new life breathed into it all of a sudden as to its capabilities to wrong everything that had been originally right with the world and became what is in fact utterly and undeniably wrong. And of course a lot of people, perhaps some even at the sound of my voice, get all up in arms about the fact that Christians talk about sin all the time as if that's all there is, right? I get it. and But to that claim, I say, yes. Guilty, as charged, and uh, yeah, definitely so. And as you've heard me say time and time again, if you don't see that, you could probably finish my line. You need to get out more. You need to carry your own mirror with you more. And if you de indeed do not agree that sin is the utterly pervasive problem, I... I don't really know what to tell you. In fact, it was the late theologian Reinhold Niebuhr that said <laughs> very accurately these profound words. The only Christian doctrines, if all you people don't believe in anything the Bible says and you can't prove it, he says the only Christian doctrine for which there's ample empirical evidence is the doctrine of original sin. And I say amen to that. In fact, one of my favorite stories is of G.K. Chesterton. He was a brilliant philosopher, British uh, philosopher, uh, writer, and, and author of the Father Brown series that will bring familiarity to some, who was uh, once asked to put forth his thesis on a paper for a magazine on what he felt was wrong with the world. And so he did, and he accurately replied, sent them one page paper that had two simple words on it. It said... I am. So when they asked him what was wrong with the world, he said, I am. And I would ditto that of my own life and tell you that if you do not see your own capacity for sin in every aspect of your life, you've, you've missed pretty much everything. In fact, verse 13 of our text agrees wholeheartedly what the law divulged in us when it says, did that which is good, because he assumes they're asking this question, did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was 
It was sin producing death in me through that which is good. <laughs> I mean, you know, he came in the back door and, and gave a whammy. The law, the opportunity the enemy took in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment, in other words, pointing it out, might become sinful beyond measure. Beyond measure, okay? And on the authority of all that is written in this sacred book, I can tell you that if you don't have a grasp of what you see in the world through the right set of eyes as the repercussions and manifestation of sin at its very core in every nook and cranny of life and have a grasp of your own capabilities of sin in your own life, you'll never be able to get to God. It won't happen. You see, because sin is what's wrong with the world, my friend. Pay attention. It's in you. It's in me. It's in your family tree that you think is so perfect because you uh, so-and-so went to this college or that, so-and-so is a doctor, lawyer, Indian chief, whatever and such, never realizing that pride and so much more hidden in your family tree that goes before fall and is in fact sin beyond measure too. Good Lord, please. And it's also in your government that you blindly trust. And if COVID-19 didn't bring this to the forefront of your mind to wrestle with, to, to really recognize this, then I've got some swamp land in Florida I'd love to sell you. If you understand what I'm saying. And it's also in your job and the things that cause it to go wrong every single day and why there's really never any real contentment in work because work was going to be hard, remember? In the fall, remember, work was going to be difficult. It's a continual reminder every day that you won't find your satisfaction in that. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's in your neighbors and the things that they say and do and, and don't do. And then the things that go on behind closed doors in your own neighborhood that if you knew you would not be able to sleep at night. Some of us know it and still sleep. That might be problematic too. And it's in the bill of goods that your nightly entertainment incessantly sells you and numbs you from anything truthful gaining the light of day in your life. And it's it's in the nightly news that is anything but good for the most part and which hides a lot of what is actually true of it. That's a mouthful. It's pervasive in the world. It's front and center and a real problem of the hour and every hour. It is in the DNA of man and that is where we find the proof that we are in fact guilty as charged. All we got to do is go to the DNA. And Paul says, thirdly and lastly, that's why we had to die and rise with Christ in order to be fruitful and multiply the right kind of fruit. That's right. Grace. By way of illustration, Paul used a new marriage analogy as an arrangement that would actually have the potential to create good and lasting fruit pleasing to God and that would produce spiritual progeny that would cause a watching world to actually pay attention. I'm not so sure they're doing it as much right now as I'd, I'd like to see. Maybe maybe I need to keep working on helping to fix that myself. First 6 tells us, it says, but now we are released from the law having died so that to that which held us captive so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code, you see. That's why. This is something Paul says that his Jew buddy should know since they were the ones supposedly in the know and they were to be teachers of the blind, if you remember when we started out our time together. And yes, another illustration that Paul gives us to help us understand before we get to the rest of chapter 7 and fully understanding this so that we can understand our death, our death to the law's abysmal marriage, quite frankly. And then understanding also what we are, in fact, alive to in our inward man and woman so that we can defeat the pull of sin, which we will talk about in the upcoming days. That sin that longs to get us to obey once again, the very thing that's wrong with the world wants to have its way with us. 
I'm going to leave that with you today, and hopefully we'll get back to this fascinating chapter next week and the answers to life's many questions in regards to sin that will help us along the way. I'm going to leave you with that. Um, be sure to subscribe to this channel. You just click on the like button and then hit the little bell and all, and all these will come to you. And be sure to share it with somebody. Leave your comments. Be kind. But feel free to leave your comments. Agree or disagree. It's all welcome as long as you do so in a good spirit. Love to hear from you. Be sure to subscribe, though. Subscribe to martinoprince.com, my blog. I finally put up a blog a couple weeks ago. i got to get back to it. Oh, gosh. It is what it is. Life goes on, right? And then also I've put these up on Rumble, so if you want to go there, the same channel is there as well. I pray that you have a blessed Lord's Day. Hopefully with some family and friends. Hopefully with the Lord some. Hopefully with some time for reflection and looking at your week ahead about how we can more get this into us and become all that he wants us to be. Good day. God bless. Take care.